So here's your fun fact of the day, and it, um, it's um, when I ran across this by chance uh, when I saw um, Queen Elizabeth uh, talking uh, yesterday about the coronavirus, of course. But I happened to find this. Uh, this is your fun fact of the day uh, from the same article that I tend have been reading from for a while, 100 Totally Useless Facts That Are Too Entertaining for Words. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II is a trained mechanic. Uh, during World War II, then 18-year-old Princess Elizabeth was a member of the, of the Women's Auxiliary Territorial Service, making her the only woman in the British Royal, Force, uh, Royal Family to have served in the armed forces and only living head of states to serve in the Second World War. Wow. Uh, second subaltern Elizabeth Windsor, as she was called during her service, trained as a mechanic and military truck driver, according to Time magazine. Uh, interestingly, Her Majesty is also the only person in Britain who doesn't need a driver's license to get behind the wheel. So, that's pretty cool. Um, sort of a British theme, I'm also wearing my Wimbledon shirt because anybody who's a tennis fan out there are very sad to see that, um, that Wimbledon has been cancelled for the first time in 75 years. Um, but still, kind of saw it coming, but it's still kind of sad. So let's get started, shall we? That was a long intro. As you all know, I'm an irregular so to my class. As you know, I'm uh, prone to making my intros longer than I should. Uh, but let's start, um, let's start actually on all fours. I was about to lie down. It's not Shavasana yet, but we're, we're getting there. So child pose, anything uh, you wanna do uh, to make it uh, adaptable to your body um, it's, um, it's a child's pose, um, it's a general concept uh, of a position. Any position um, is just a, an idea, and it may not be, uh, you may not be positioned exactly as I am, and I may not be positioned exactly as you are. So right now, I am reaching my arms out in front of it, but you may prefer to bend your elbows and place uh, your head on your arms, or even to take your arms out to the sides, or to take them alongside your body with your uh, palms facing the ceiling. So do any of those that uh, gives you the best possible uh, place of comfort. And now begin to um, to draw in as much air as you can. Hold your breath for a moment. Holding your, your oxygen in quarantine. And then exhale, de-quarantine it. Hold your exhalation for a moment. Inhale again, maybe a bit deeper than before. Hold breath, and if you want, even this time, while holding your breath, create tension in your abdominals, uh, in your arms, throughout your body, and exhale. Hold exhalation. Good. All right, resume breathing normally. Now let's make our way up onto all fours now. And we'll do um, a few versions of uh, cat and cow pose, right? Um, basic movement of the spine, do it just about every session, some iteration of it every session um, that I tend to teach. Uh, so you can spread your fingers out to get the sense that you're building your pose from the ground up. The right hand is trying to spiral clockwise, the left hand counterclockwise. Neither hand actually doing that. They just uh, lock uh, onto the mat with uh, the grippiness between your hands uh, and the mat. Uh, on your exhalation, make your spine as rounded as you can. Try to push your belly button in. Try to curl your head up toward your uh, upper chest area. So you're maximally stretching the back of the body, or at least uh, down to the um, tailbone, not on the legs necessarily. And then inhale your deepest inhalation, drawing everything in, and exhale, sending everything out. 
maximally contracting. And then inhale again. Maybe you can find a slightly more pronounced extension throughout your neck and your back. You can hold that for a moment. And then exhale. Hold exhalation. Good, back to a neutral position. So we'll do the same thing, but uh, now with staggered hands. Uh, just because one hand will be a little closer, not that close, but a little closer to extension while the other hand is a little closer to what your shoulder might do in a downward dog, for instance. So I have my left hand a little farther in front of me than my right hand, and I have my left knee a little farther in front than my right knee. It's almost like a, a cat starting to crawl after uh, a mouse, poor mouse. But see if that's um, change in position change in uh, sort of vectors of, of, um, of weight going down. Sorry, I'm not a physicist. I'm not good with that sort of vocabulary, but that's what popped into my head. Uh, you inhale, I'm sorry, you're exhaling as you round your back, push the ground away, push your spine toward the sky, and then inhale back into, uh, actually for the first time in this iteration of the hands and feet, uh, into the spinal extension. Inhale again, I'm sorry, exhale. Even through the mouth if you need to. That helps you to feel all the contractions in your abdominals a little bit more. And then inhale, back here. So one more of these. Exhale. And then just like that cat, maybe crawling after its prey Uh, you switch hands. So the right hand is forward, left hand is back. Right knee is forward, left knee is back. Just a little bit, maybe like a hand length or you know four or five inches um, in terms of this horizontal plane uh, of your mat. Your exhalation, rounding your back, of course. You create that posterior pelvic tilt. So the tailbone is kind of curling under and forward and maybe even a little up, depending on how pronounced your uh, coccyx curve is. And then your inhalation, you go back again, but now with the hands positioned uh, opposite way, into that extension position. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. All right, so another uh, variation on uh, this, this is called, uh, I call this the segmented cat and cow pose because you're having to kind of um, mentally segmentize, new word, uh, your attention between your cervical spine, your neck, and your thoracic and lumbar. Uh, and I've done this uh, in my uh, regular classes before, maybe not virtually. This is the first time for that. So um, just see what I'm doing first if you're unfamiliar. Hands are back in the same uh, horizontal plane as are the knees. Instead of the traditional head lifting and spine extending, you keep the spine extended, save for the cervical spine and the neck, and you allow your neck to lower. For any of you all with keen uh, sense of hearing, I'm very close to train tracks right now. <laughs> you might be able to hear the train, so my apologies for that. So this is your inhalation. Your spine is uh, extended except for your neck. Neck is lowered. And then, sorry, on your exhalation, you round your back and lift your head. And to me, this almost feels like a really nice way to squeeze out tension from the upper trapezius, uh, upper back and upper neck. And then inhale. Your spine uh, extends, head lowers. Uh, exhale, round it back, lifting head. That's confusing, huh? Go see one more round of that. This is your inhalation, 
It's almost like you fell asleep while doing cat and cow pose. And this is your exhalation. Pushing mid back toward the sky. Let's actually hold this for a second. You know, not the most beautiful spinal position. Won't get you onto the cover of the yoga magazines, but uh, it's a nice way to feel like you're squeezing uh, tension out of your neck. So try to push your head into your neck, your neck and uh, sorry, try to push your head into your upper back and vice versa. And then release that. Now let's get back on track. Pun very much intended there. Let's lie down. Arms out to your sides. Left leg over right leg. Uh, for those of you who have the ability to hook your left foot uh, under your right calf, going to the big toe side of your right calf. I am not one of those people, typically, unless I am supremely warmed up. Um, so that is not the case right now. Uh, then you can hook your foot underneath. But if it's not, if you're like me, uh, then you can keep your foot just uh, hanging off to the side. But maybe keep it in dorsiflexion so it just feels like it's kind of active. It's pushing against an imaginary force. And I may not pay attention to that for too long because I'll start talking about something else. So you lower your knees over to the right. No focus on, on an intentional breathing pattern here. Just focus on trying to let your knees go side to side. So see what it's like at first to do this while your right foot remains in contact with the floor. So when your knees are going to the right, your outer edge of your right foot, pinky side, is touching the floor. And then when you take your knees over to the left, probably won't get down all the way. Uh, mine are, at least. Then you'll be on the inner edge, the um, uh, big toe side of your foot. Then, try that, uh, if your lower back is okay with it, you find a little more hip flexion, draw the knees a little more toward the chest, and then take your knees, squeeze your legs into each other, over toward the right, this variation of revolved abdominal pose, you take them back up, squeeze those legs into each other, take them over to the left, and then back up, they go. One more time to the right, lifting back toward the middle and then over toward the left push the legs into each other and then take them back up okay then spread uh, the legs just a little bit wider than your mat just a little bit of abdominal work before we do uh, that leg cross on the other side Find that posterior pelvic tilt. So that would actually look like you're trying to push your lower back into the floor. You create a, a bit of a um, uh, decrease in space uh, between uh, lower back and the ground. Inhale on your back here. And then exhale, just get maybe your back from like a couple of ribs below your shoulder blades off the ground if you can. And then lower. Your exhalation, your lift, and inhale lower. And geez, just from doing that, I'm feeling a lot of shaking, right? Because I'm actively pushing my lower back into the floor, not flat as a pancake, uh, but just preserving my lumbar curve, making sure it doesn't overextend in the midst of this. Right? Maybe about two or three more of these, depending on the speed you're doing this with. Just make sure it's more Slowpoke Rodriguez rather than um, Speedy Gonzalez. Yep, that's it. So let's do that on the other side. Uh, right leg crosses over left leg. Again, if you can hook the foot second time, third time, fourth time. If you could do it that many times, you probably need to work on more strength training too. I'll be the first to tell you, yoga is not the end-all be-all of a fitness. You gotta mix it up. Variety is the spice of life. And for your body and your and all of its constituents too, all of its constituent parts. Uh, your arms are out to the sides and um, you can have palms down if you want. I've had palms up and I just like, I'm kind of a stickler for keeping uh, the myofascial lines uh, being tested in the same way. So I'm 
going to my hands the same, uh, facing the same way. So they're supinated, they're pointing toward the ceiling. Knees are going from side to side, three or four or, or five times, depending on the speed. Um, hopefully you've started since I've been talking a lot. Um, you are moving at um, uh, Slowpoke Rodriguez speed. I'm more Speedy Gonzalez in my talking, forgive me. Several times, first several times you've done these with your uh, left foot on the floor, pivoting across the, the sole of the foot to the outer edge when the knees go left, and then to the inner edge when the knees go right. And as we begin this second option here, your feet come off the floor. Your left foot was the only one touching, but so both feet are away from the ground now. Knees draw toward the chest. You try to keep them sort of hugged in, nestled in toward your a torso as you go from side to side. Again, not very fast. It's slow enough so that you can feel all possible uh, suppleness uh, seeking sensations. It's a very alliterative suggestion um, throughout this movement. Good. And then release that. Okay, so we'll do another variation of that uh, crunch. Attempt, if you can, to spread your legs a little bit wider. One benefit of being at home, you don't have to see anybody spreading your legs other than whoever you're quarantined with. I wouldn't necessarily have the space for this in a, um, if we were all together in a um, pre or post coronavirus uh, land. Um, so your feet are a little bit wider so that you can maybe feel a little more stretch in your inner thighs. That's uh, obvious thing number one. Um, but that will also start to challenge how far away your lower back is from the floor because you're pulling your hip flexors farther away from, from the spine and they will start to anteriorly tilt. So you have to push your lower back toward the ground. You can even squeeze your glutes a little bit. Interlace fingers behind your head on your exhalation. Crunching up a bit. Uh, if you're getting uh, cramps on the outsides of your hips, because there's sort of a little pocket of tissue, pretty much right where your pocket on your pants or your shorts is, uh, that can be a little underused um, by a lot of us, uh, hip abductors and internal rotators, because maybe we walk with feet closer and, and feet turned out a lot of the time. So uh, if that is the case, you can actually turn your feet in somewhat, and uh, maybe that's that will engage them a bit more, make them a little less lazy, if the lazy factor of having the feet turned out uh, was causing the cramping. I have about two or three more of these. Good. All right. Draw your knees into your chest. Move them in a circle. Small circle, nothing, nothing huge. And then reverse that. All right. So let's uh, sit up now. And then we'll stand too. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have to stand a little farther back so that you can um, see me. You know what, in fact, I'm just going to improvise here and make my camera, whoops, go a little bit taller. There we go. Hello, can you see me? So um, now that we're standing, this is something I call uh, Sorry, I had to look at my notes, just to make sure I'm not skipping something. Because yes, I do forget things, I need to write them down. Um, I call this the compass lunge, right? North, south, east, west. So we're lunging in four directions. Mm, excuse me. So, here's how that'll go. Just 
again, I'm just standing back so I'm fully in view. Hopefully you can uh, see everything here. So if you need to watch me first, uh, feel free to do that. You take a step forward. Oh, I just have a, had a visual of that moment when Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade movie steps into the void, but he steps on what had been a trompe l'oeil, a, a trickery of the eye, you know, just before he goes to get the Holy Grail. It's the way my brain works. You take a step forward with your right foot, right? you have about 90 degree angles in your lower body, and then you powerfully push off. Then you take a step to your side, so that was north, here's east, at least for me, it may not be uh, east for you if you're doing mirror image. And then you're in this wide squat. You can even hold your knees open with your elbows. And then hello, adductors, inner thighs. And then you step back together. So I'm just going to step forward a little bit because I'm about to run into my chair behind me. Then you have your reverse lunge from there. So now you're going south. And try to make sure your knee is tracking over your ankle, not going toward the big toe side. That's called a valgus knee. You want it to go more uh, toward the left, a little safer for your ACL. And then step forward with your right foot. So the left foot has just been stationary the whole time, except for mine, because I've had to demo things and make sure I'm in camera view. But yours has been stationary. Then uh, this is the, the more awkward, the most awkward uh, position of the four um, steps here. So. See if this is um, appropriate for you. You take your right leg, whoops, and it's a good balance uh, exercise too. You're balancing on your left leg as you reach your right leg over to the left. So it's kind of a, sometimes it's referred to as a curtsy lunge. And if you want to make that harder, you could, and why wouldn't you? You could lift the foot and slide it out to the side and then it'll almost feel like pigeon pose a little bit over here, right? So I don't know if you were or were not doing that with me, but we'll do two rounds each side. So we'll just say that was one. We'll do one more full one and then go to do two on the other side. Left foot is stationary right now. Step forward with your right foot and then step back. Step sideways. So that was north. This is east. And then back to the middle. And then stepping south. Whoops. Into my chair. Step forward, and then going west, westward bound, either with the floating foot, whoops, or not floating, and then release. Whew. All right, so I'm just a little winded even from doing that. So let's do that on the second side. Let's move my chair a little bit. All right, so it'll be right foot that's stationary. Again, mine is not because I'm having to make adjustments within the uh, limited space I have. Um, it's, it's enough space, but it's, uh, you know, sometimes I have to adjust. But ideally, you have your right foot stationary the whole time. So here we go. We'll step forward with the left foot. Right. And then step it back. Your abdominals are drawn in, of course, as often as you can uh, think of it. Left foot. So you can either keep it on the ground, just sort of slide it, or it's almost like a, I don't know, I'm not a, a martial arts expert, but it's sort of like a dramatic little sidekick over here, maybe not so dramatic, from me, and then you try to go into that wide squat. You're just taking a regular squat and then butterflying it. Then you step back, then left foot goes back, you are in your lunge. My left knee is just hovering above the floor a bit, and then step it forward again, and then left foot then reaches over to the right. It can either stay on the ground or come off the ground and I'm kind of counterbalancing by leaning a little bit toward my left, but then I bring even more emphasis on the outside of my right hip and your right hip too, hopefully. Release. One more of those, a little faster. Left foot forward, step it back. Left foot sideways, squatting. Take it back in. Left foot back this time and forward, and then left foot over adducts. It goes beyond the midline, over to the right, curtsying to the queen, the, the queen mechanic. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, if you just joined in, go to the beginning. 
or the video later on the rebroadcast and you'll know what I'm talking about. All right, release that. Next, uh, let's try um, you, taking advantage of the fact that we don't always have chairs uh, in a yoga studio or at a gym. Maybe we do, but in an, in an exercise um, setting, and maybe not in a yoga setting. So I'm just gonna move my chair, let's see, right here. I might be partially out of headshot here, unless I adjust this, whoops, the other way, right there. Now, now actually I'm gonna keep it down here because I'll need you to see what my foot is doing too. You don't need to move your mat, but I just moved it because I don't want to get uh, chair leg marks on this nice $70 mat I got. Okay, so here's a lunge um, using uh, the chair. It'll be a pulsation between a lunge uh, and a hamstring stretch. So you could start off doing um, a plank on a chair. And this should actually, in theory, be easier an easier plank than having your hands on the floor because the angle of your body in relation to the floor um, is, you know, well, sorry, I'm not good at geometry, but when you're spread out across gravity more, it's, it's a little harder on your body. So when you're slightly closer to vertical, it's a little bit easier. All right, so I'm squeezing my glutes, right foot, steps forward, then, uh, as you squeeze your left buttock and try to posteriorly tilt, that might also bend the back knee slightly, you try to descend, almost like you're just doing a squat in the right leg, pretty much, trying to stay somewhat upright. I'm feeling a massive stretch uh, in my left thigh. And then you bring it back up, and then depending on how sensitive your heel is and, and the hardness of the surface that your right foot is on right now, uh, you can pivot onto the heel Try to drive it into the floor and act like you're trying to drag it backwards. Right? And I actually just caught myself, excuse me, uh, hyperextending slightly for a split second. So another reminder uh, to keep the abdominals drawn in. And then you try to lunge, maybe slightly adjust the foot. Oh, my mat is slipping a little bit. Yeah, going back and forth. Maybe about another 20 to 30 seconds. Try to hold on to that um, lunge position for a moment. Maybe let go of the chair. Try to hold that for five, four, three, two, one. Good, and then, whoops, again, slight adjustment here. Try to drive your heel, your right heel, straight into the ground. Push the ground, push the chair away so you have space. You're protracting your uh, shoulder blades. And then release, let's take that right leg back, back into plank here. Yep. Just let me um, turn around so you can see what I'm doing here. If there's any confusion. All right, so you try to find, form this nice straight line with your body and then keep everything fairly stationary, even as you just are making this transition to stepping the left foot forward. Yeah. A little posterior tilt to your pelvis. Squeeze your right buttock. Then imagine you are sort of um, maybe one quarter of the way into doing a squat, but only on the left leg. So then, oh, I want to squat more. Start to bend. The left knee a little bit more, start to close down, hip flexion on that left side, and then you get more extension on the right side. Squeeze that right buttock even more. I'm sweating like crazy right here. Then you come back up, 
You have your, gut, you have your hands excuse me, on your chair. Heel is trying to drive down into the floor to create the impression of doing hip extension in the left leg. So you just do that isometrically. And then try to drag the heel backwards to create the effect of, um, of trying to stretch the hamstrings a bit more. Oops, I was getting ahead of myself. I was doing the static part first. Let's keep it dynamic just a little longer, shifting from one position to the other. Ooh. All right, and then next time you are lunging, Try to maybe let go of it. Create that posterior tilt. I usually imagine I'm trying to rev my motorcycle engine there. Right. My right leg is shaking. I don't know if you could see that. It's not just for the camera. It's legit, I promise. Ooh, that was enough on this side for me. Maybe not for you. And then you can hold on to the stretch in your left heel. Your right heel might be off the floor a little bit. Ideally, you're, um, you're not uh, you know, shifting your hips way over to the left or way over to the right. You wanna feel like your buttocks are, would be relatively level on this diagonal plane. Right. Hopefully I'm a good enough demo for that. Yeah. Good. Then let's take this into essentially uh, a downward dog, which I practically never teach in, in, in its actual iteration, uh, more traditional uh, hands on the floor thing uh, aspect. Uh, but keep your hands on your chair. And I have a very grippy vinyl chair that I'm holding onto with my slightly sweaty, recently washed. D COVID 19ified hands. So I'm getting a decent amount of grip as I do that. And hopefully you you are feeling the activity in your shoulders. You want to act like, as if you're trying to push this chair through the floor, so you're not just sinking passively into your shoulders and creating any kind of um, uh, compression in your sockets there. Yep. All right. Then we'll actually work on tree pose uh, with the option of sitting down in a moment. So let me show you. So you can turn your chair uh, to face me. And I'm almost fully in the shot, not totally. All right, so chair pose. I'm sorry, this chair is doing chair pose. You are doing tree pose. You might need something else to, to hold on to if your balance is really uh, wobbly. So stand on your left foot, kick your right foot and maybe go somewhere up into your left inner thigh. If not, your right foot goes down a little bit. Try not to push too much um, sideways force into your knee. It is a hinge joint, so it only goes uh, front and back. So I'm trying to uh, squeeze my quads on my left uh, thigh, and I could feel them sort of popping up under my right foot. Squeeze your left buttock, and then, whoa, you can only see part of me, I know. So you can reach your arms out to your sides, like they're the branches of the tree without getting too, too new agey on you here. Right. So you might need them out here for balance assistance in a second. So here's where the chair comes in. Stay here if this is enough work for you, or cross your right ankle over your left knee, rather than sending, I'm just gonna turn sideways so you can see, rather than sending your left knee forward, which is 
maybe not so great for it uh, in the long run if you were to do it over and over and over again. Instead, send, whoops, try to send your hips back behind you. You may need to shift your arms out in front of you. It's like a cross-legged Utkatasana chair pose. And then as gracefully as you can, you try to actually have a seat. Right. So give that a shot. You could also come into it this way. Coming out of tree pose and then just sitting down. That's fine. Do, do what your body uh, can right now. Right. Then a little hip hinge here. Try to fold at your hips. It's going to be a different degree for everybody. And I can't see what everyone's doing right now. So you have to make sure that you're not allowing an excessive, <clears throat> I'm getting choked up about this, not allowing an excessive amount of uh, flexion, the rounding, to come into your back and sort of flopping like this. You can actually use the fact that you're holding onto your knee to pull yourself upright, you know, just to facilitate your, your neutral spinal curves, uh, and then hinge forward. And it's like replicating pigeon pose on a chair, in a sense. And speaking of chairs, depending on what you have within reach, I have a, a chair here, conveniently within arm's reach here. Um, you can walk your hands down that chair or whatever object you have in front of you. And then sit up. And we'll do that on the second side. All right, so chair pose. We're just gonna stand to the side. Uh, actually, I'll just do this sideways. How about I? So you can see what I did. <coughs> uh, left leg will be, is that right? Yeah, left leg, whoops, goes up. I cheated, I held onto my chair when I put my foot up there. Your left leg goes into your right thigh. Here's your tree pose on your second side. Right. Stick with that or you slide your left ankle, I'll just turn this way for a second. You slide your left ankle onto, or just above your right kneecap. Then, arms, maybe if they've been out here, they start to kind of sweep dramatically out in front of you and you come down for a gentle landing. Yeah. All right. And then I'm holding on to my leg and my foot with my hands here, just to help me establish this nice upright posture. And then hinge at your hips. Yeah, and you might feel uh, the stretch in your left buttock. Now the muscle that's targeted um, most of the time in doing a, a pigeon-like position. Uh, the piriformis, uh, I think it's an external rotator most of the time, but I think when your hip goes into uh, hip flexion, I've read, I think maybe the source with Joe Musculino, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, but I think when it gets to like 30 degrees of flexion, it becomes an internal hip rotator. But don't, don't quote me on that, I think it's, um, that could be one explanation as to why this leg, this muscle that's typically an external rotator, is stretching more when it's already externally rotated, when it should be contracted. So take your chair. We're start to, starting to wind things down now. And we'll use that as we recline. All right, so I'm presuming that um, your chair, that you can approximate maybe about a 90 degree angle in your knees, but you know, it could be thereabouts. 
and then you lie down. And here, uh, we'll just stretch the back of the right leg right now. So I'm holding on to the back of my right thigh. If you want, you can feel the stretch more by number one, dorsiflexing the foot, dorsiflexing, pull uh, the toes toward the floor, point the heel toward the ceiling. Uh, or you can also add on, either or, uh, you can walk your hands uh, up your legs. Sometimes I call this the jack and the beanstalk variation of stretching the hamstring. So you're climbing your, your leg beanstalk here. Right, and then you bring the leg with you. More gracefully and slowly than the speed with which the beanstalk itself uh, fell to the ground in the story. You pull that leg toward you. And yes, my hips have come off the floor a little bit. So I've kind of found my end range of, of stretching my hamstrings. But the cool thing is that if you were to hold this you know, a decent amount of time, then your muscles would effectively give up and <laughs> they, um, they'll find maybe a new resting length the longer you stay there. Yeah. And I'm actually getting a little shaking as I do this. Yeah. All right, let's switch sides. Maybe you were too. So we'll start off just initially holding on to the back of the thigh. See how that feels. Stay here if this is enough. Otherwise, climb your, your leg stock there. And then bring it with you. And I'm actually sort of muscling it away, in a way. It's like I'm, I don't know, it's like I'm doing sort of a, a weird, uh, it's like a reverse face pull, I don't know, with internal rotation. And then you try to pull that leg towards your face. Speaking of face pulls. Google that later if you're not sure what I mean. Usually that exercise is done with a lot of external rotation like that. Yeah, good. And then pull your heels just a little bit closer to the edge of the chair. So in a sense, you're sort of doing a perspective change of child's pose, right? It's on your back a little bit, but having the heels propped up will give you some uh, opportunity to uh, find the reset button on the hips and the lower back and the hamstrings. And then either keep your legs, you can slide them back onto your chair so you're getting this um, uh, semblance uh, of an inversion, right? When you reverse the effects of gravity or attempt to and uh, help the lymph uh, move around. Or you could take your legs uh, off the chair and uh, just have them straddle the chair. And either keep your arms at your sides or on your belly. If they're out at your sides, maybe turn them toward the ceiling and close your eyes. And I'm going to count down eight breaths as I hold up five fingers here. <laughs> Counting down eight breaths and feel free to use a tempo different from the one that I'm using uh, to count if your breathing uh, needs to be uh, different. Inhale. Exhale, eight. Inhale. Exhale, seven. Inhale. Exhale, six. Inhale. 
exhale five. Let's make the second half of this even deeper, have even deeper breaths. Inhale. Exhale, four. Stretch out that exhalation a bit more. Inhale. Exhale, three. Inhale. Exhale, two. Inhale. Exhale, one. Feel free to stay here longer, tune me out for this next uh, minute or so, or uh, roll yourself to one side. You can sit up to face, um, face the camera, face your phone, face whatever direction you want. Maybe with eyes closed still. And if you feel like it's a natural um, closure to this session, draw your palms together, bow toward them in gratitude to your body and in gratitude to all of your blessings. Thank you very much. Well done. Namaste. Have a wonderful evening or morning or afternoon if you watch this at a later time. Thank you.